Okay, dance history from the ancient to the Renaissance. We're going to go over some basics throughout dance history. This is a very cursory view of this material. A lot happens in between the moments that we'll talk about, but these are things that I'd like you to uh, think about for your preparation for this course. So historically, dance has been used to communicate um, above and beyond all else. Movement is one of our, well, it is our first language. When we're born, we, we speak through our body. So dance in its origins would evoke responses, express ideas, and overall celebrate the joy of movement. It's one of the oldest art forms that we have. From ancient Greece, they thought that dance was a direct creation of the gods. And you can see here from animal play that they also thought that the movements of all the creatures of the, of the world were dancing. So Plato says the dance arose from the natural desire of the young of all creatures to move their bodies in order to express their emotions, especially joy. In the primitive time period, the Paleolithic and the Neolithic, which is about 30,000 to 3,000 before Common Era, Dance had different functions and people practiced dancing for different reasons. So because of no common language, movement and dance was used to communicate. It was used to control forces. It was used to unify a group. We can unify people by having them participate in movement that is in unity, in unison we call it, in dance. Um, they created rituals. It was a means of expression. It was also a means of documenting culture. A lot of stories about history of cultures of people are held within dance steps and the symbolism of those steps. Um, here's a, a beautiful picture, Matisse's circle. Circle was the first dance formation because it unified groups. You can probably remember in your lives being in a circle where everyone could see each other. Um, so everyone could be on the same page about things and also have protection from whatever's on the outside of the circle. Rituals were very important in dance. You probably have some of your own rituals. And rituals often um, had symbolic meaning to them and uh, affected some sort of change. I think, you know, you're different after the ritual is completed than you were before. This was often spiritual in nature involved repeatable movement. So usually symbolic, usually involving rhythmic activities, hand clapping, feet stomping, rhythm based on uh, natural functions of the body, breathing, heart rate, uh, seasons, etc. Um, day and night, like I said. Movements often in rituals mimicked animals and you can think of what rituals you practice. You might have some rituals that that you use to prepare yourself for the day or prepare yourself for some certain activity. Types of rituals in, in Paleolithic and Neolithic times involved um, seeking uh, fertility and health of children, uh, beneficial harvest, uh, fruitful hunting, initiations and rites, um, protection of animals, spiritual connection to the gods, uh, healing rituals, weddings, funerals, etc., war. Here's some pictures of a few different dance rituals from different um, cultures. Maybe some of you have been lucky enough to travel and see different rituals, danced rituals in different cultures. There you see a circle. In the ancient period, about 3,000 before Common Era to 400 Common Era, this is when things started to develop and to change in the art of dance. People became a little bit more aware of what dance looked like, how it was presented, its form, how it started, where it went, how it ended, and the content of the work. And rituals then became ceremonies, which were a little bit more dramatic, a little bit more elaborate, and usually involved a special occasion of some sort. So any of these uh, special occasions where there was a a distinct protocol to what, what happened. These were um, developed in the ancient period. So people became more conscious of the movement, how it looked, 
what it meant. Rituals became more structured into ceremonies, and ceremonies were definitely more artistic than the more primitive rituals. They served as a spiritual practice or sometimes just for entertainment. At this time also, there were developments in language, writing, agriculture, government, and religion. In India, we have an example of a traditional dance that was used in ceremonies and is still practiced today. So um, beginning in about 2000 before Common Era, BCE, um, theater and dance productions in India told religious stories and reflected belief systems that impacted all of Asia. And many of these ideas are still practiced today. Bharatanatyam is a classical Indian dance um, that originated uh, before Common Era. And these dances, um, classical Indian dances, are still practiced today. This is a sacred temple dance, as an example, and it's performed by Devadasis, who were female temple dancers. Um, males do this now, but originally um, they did not. And this told stories of good and evil. And characteristics of this type of dance involved extremely fluid and very expressive arms, specific head and hand gestures, those hand gestures are called mudras, eye movements and facial expressions that were particularly animated, um, complex rhythms that are very different in the upper body versus the low body, lots of stamping feet and deep plie, which is a bend in the knees. Um, typically, the, the dancer would stay in a very low position um, for much of the dance, and lots of stamina <laughs> is needed for this particular type of dancing. Let's take a look at some Bharatanatyam. So notice this beautiful Bharatanatyam dancer. She's quite famous performing at the Joyce Theater. Notice the gestures and the hands. Notice the feet and the stamping and the deep plie there. And you note her makeup is really exaggerated so that you can see her facial features. Okay, looking at ancient Greece um, and the Minoan culture on the island of Crete in 3000 BCE, the inhabitants of Crete cultivated music, song, and dance as part of their religious life and for their entertainment, but also for education. This was a very important part of um, Greek culture. So the classical period, a little bit more recent in the 5th century BCE, this was the height of of the artistic development of the Greek period. Beauty and art provided spiritual satisfaction and fulfillment for this particular culture. So poetry thrived, music, art, dance, theater, all these things were very, very vital in this particular period. And all of these provided the basics of our educational system. So this is how education, this is how people learned and processed information was through the arts. Um, dance and the arts at this time did not portray a realistic view of life, but rather um, portrayed high ideals, so um, aspirations of high art, spirituality, and sophisticated intellect, things that people thought were important. Plato says the dance of all arts is the one that most influences the soul. Dancing is divine in its nature and is a gift of the gods. And here's where we come to, to Dionysus, who was originally a god of fertility of nature, and later um, uh, was uh, the god of wine, but he was associated with wild and ecstatic religious rites that involved dancing. Later um, known as the god of wine, as I said, who loosens inhibitions and inspires creativity in music and poetry. He was also called Bacchus. Here's a few representations of him and a beautiful painting of what we call dance mania, which you're gonna see several examples of in this class. Um, here's, a, here's a representation of what that might have looked like, but dance mania, based on the cult of Dionysus who released inhibitions, etc., involved um, first happening in the, in the ancient period and then in classical Greece. This was our first example of um, the ability of dance to transcend consciousness. So women known as maenads and others would strip off all their clothes and 
run out into the forest and dance wildly and crazily, but but not they transcended a state of consciousness, and so this was considered highly spiritual. Greek theater, very important part of not only the educational system but the artistic system in Greece. Maybe some of you have been lucky enough to go to Greece and see some of those stadium-like theaters. Um, Greek theater had different ways of transmitting and communicating messages. There were tragedies, and these were dancers that were moderate in tempo and very expressive and very emotional. Um, comedies were very animated, and the dancing was fast and light and grotesque. And when I say grotesque, it doesn't mean gross, um, but the grotesque was used as a term to um, define comedy. So grotesque were playful little characters and in some of the theater that would, you know, mess with the audience a little bit and um, shake things up. So it was more of a humorous thing than a, than a grotesque or any kind of horrific idea. And then satires were satirical and quite rude comedic plays. And all of these involved dance. So dance ensembles consisted of both speaking and dancing roles. And there was a Greek chorus, usually as part of all Greek theater, and, you know, this is a very general lecture here, but the chorus represented the mind of the community or the thoughts of the community. So whatever the main characters were doing, the action of the play was, uh, the emotion was reflected by the chorus of dancers. And they would sort of let people know how the community felt about um, what was going on in the action of the play. These plays had mythological creatures like nymphs and satyrs, which were half human and half animal. You see like minotaurs that were a bull, half a bull with a man on the, on the top of that. So this is an example of that idea of more of a, an idealistic view of things, not very realistic. So some terms in ancient Greek theater um, that we can be curious about because they relate to some words that we use for dance today in dance appreciation. Orchestai is rhythmic movement of many sorts. There are many dance companies called orchestras that, that derive that, the art and act of dancing, but really what it means is rhythmic movement of, of many sorts. Chironomia, a complex system of gestures and symbolic movements. There you can see the roots of the word choreography. Um, some of the dances, the examples, um, in this time, uh, one of my favorites is the Pyrrhic, which is a war dance. And this was used as military education in Athens and Sparta. So not only was it a dance to entertain, but these were where warriors could practice fighting skills um, that they would need to use later in battle. Also, gymnopedia was like present day gymnastics. And sirtos is one of the oldest dances and involves shuffling feet and dragging feet. And if you're ever lucky enough to go to a Greek festival, you will probably do sirtos. And it's one of the oldest dances in history and it still endures today. Here are a couple of photos of some of those uh, Greek theaters. And I have a video on PolyLearn of an example of how the sound and the acoustics work in the theater. Um, if the actors stand right in the center, their voices can project over the whole stadium, which is pretty amazing technology when there wasn't really any technology. <laughs> Here's some photos um, of some Greek, a veiled dancer and a funeral dance and some of the animal dances. There you see some of those mythological creatures on the bottom and an example, a picture of the Pyrrhic dance um, on top. Maenads, those were followers of Dionysus, minotaurs, as we talked about earlier. So the Maenads would do some of the dance mania. They would go and, and go in a trance and go out and dance and um, follow uh, Dionysus. All right, shifting gears to the medieval period. So this is common era, 400 to 1400, the Middle Ages, if you will. In the Islamic cultures, the Middle East and Asia, dance flourished still as entertainment um, with both artistic and folk forms. Folk dance meaning dances of the people. So Middle Eastern dance was quite popular and endured during this period. However, in Europe, in the medieval period, things were a little bit different. The Roman Empire fell, and the artistic thrust of ancient Greece was definitely squelched. So um, Christian rule stated no dance. Dancing was discouraged. It was considered pagan. It encouraged 
a separation from godlike spirituality, and so it was not embraced at all. The body and movement and sensation period was considered evil, and dancing was far too pleasurable, and it was thought then that that takes us away from, from God. Some of the folk dances remained, community building dances like maypole and round dances, those kinds of things endured, but for the most part, dancing and much of the arts were really squelched during this period. Dance mania, however, shows up again, or a type of dance mania, and this is in the age of um, the Middle Ages, we see another phenomenon of dance mania, that's the idea that, that dancing um, lends itself to a, a bit of emotional transcendence or trance. So in the 1300s, people were really preoccupied with death because of the plague, um, which killed so many people. And they had the dance macabre. Macabre is, you know, death and everything that has to do with death. So the dance of death, people became possessed and they danced in delirium. They were wild and delirious and in a trance again. So they transcended consciousness and they could not stop until they dropped. Um, and there were several speculations on what caused this. Was it a physical disorder? Was it a nutritional problem? Was it a mental or psychological response to so much death? There was even speculation that some of the grain had a mold that was a psychoactive, um, had a psychoactive effect on people uh, during this particular period. So in an age of, of the arts being very oppressed and very a dark time for dance, um, we have an amazing phenomena of dance mania show up again. There's a, a little icon of the dance macabre there. When the Renaissance came in the 1400s, guess what happened? There was a renewed interest in the theories and ideals of ancient Greece. This was a time when most the world's most captivating arts really thrived and developed. There was the emergence of the court ballet, which were ballets that were danced by the nobles, by the kings and the queens and the noble and royal courts, and they were danced for the nobility. So um, at this point, between 1400 and 1700, especially the 1600s, when we get to ballet, we'll look a lot more closely at this, but dance became a professional art at this point. This is when we started to see evidence of the proscenium stage, but the court ballets by far dominated this period and were very much characteristic of what was going on in dance. Folk dance still flourished among the working class. Dances such as the pavan, the saraband, the gavotte, the jig, the minuet, these are all rhythmic structures that define some types of classical music, but also dances. You've probably heard dancing the gavotte and the jig. This is during this period that these particular things happen. So, um, 1800s after the Renaissance was the birth of the Romantic Ballet, which we will get into in more detail when we get to ballet. But let's take a quick look at some Renaissance dance. <laughs> So notice in this, not only the costumes, which were pretty restrictive and indicated a lot of what the movement looked like, um, but these steps, if you were to see the feet, are the very beginnings of classical ballet. So after so after the Renaissance, and this again is very cursory, the contemporary period was considered after uh, 1800, um, we had the birth of the Romantic Ballet, um, but then in more recent times we have new genres being developed. So what you saw in the Renaissance dance um, you know, based on dances of the folk, that evolved into what we now know as classical ballet. But now um, we start to see at the end of the 1800s, new genres. So modern dance comes on the scene. And then later after that, um, and at the end of this century, jazz dance and more entertainment forms start to come. So there's more variety and diversity of 
of forms and artistic intent. And this, the intent vacillated really from intellectual and entertaining dances, from pagan dances to politically poignant dances. And there was a constant vacillation between those ideas. Was dance just to be entertaining and diversion or was it going to mean something? And we'll look a little bit closer into that as we progress. Um, and now in contemporary times, we have to navigate technology and the possibilities that that allows us. But overall, dance really from its very beginning, focus on the body, focus on movement, which I mentioned was our first language. Movement is our first language and, and an expressive art form and a lot of times equaled joy. All right. Thank you.